Good morning, everyone. It's occurred to me I probably shouldn't have been sat at the back today. I've been running backwards and forwards all morning. So I'm Cy Pope. As I said earlier, I'm an ordinand or a vicar in training. And I'm back here at Christchurch after my summer placement of five Sundays being away. And I have to say, it is lovely seeing familiar faces again. So this morning, I'm going to continue the uh, I've Got a Job for You series. Um, by looking at this passage on burial duty. Thank you, Roy, for that reading. But before I continue, let's dedicate this time to God in prayer. Father God, I pray you bless this time. Still our hearts. Help us to set aside distraction and the brokenness and the busyness of life. And let us draw deep into the fullness of life that you promise us. Let this time be a thin place where we hear you loud and clear. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 So I really love uh, spending time delving into the Bible and uh, researching a subject and going as deep as I can. And this week has been no different. Uh, I've looked hard and deep at this passage and really uh, found something which I've tried to summarize in one ten sentence, which I think is, I was taught as a good practice. If you can summarize what you want to say in a sentence, then uh, hopefully that will come through. So, here is a call to live our Christian lives in a manner displaying that we are expectant, we are open-minded and open-hearted servants dedicated to Christ. I'll come back to that. As I started looking, uh, I found this guy. Um, he's Matthew Henry. He is a Welsh biblical scholar writing in the early 1700s, so a long time ago, and he says this. Christians often confuse themselves about the very things which they should comfort and encourage themselves. They look to find their master in his grave clothes rather than angels in their shining garments. And then he goes on to say, but all our mistakes in religion spring from ignorance or forgetfulness of the words Christ has spoken. You see, brothers and sisters, so much doesn't change. We see forgetfulness with the disciples we are on burial duty 2,000 years ago, not expectant to see a risen Christ. And the same forgetfulness we see here that Matthew Henry spotted 300 years ago. And I wonder about us today. Take, for example, the place of women in the church. For so long, we have suppressed the voice and position of women. But what does the example of Jesus actually say? So I've got a question for you. And many of you here are Christians. And uh, which of these events do you think are the most important to Christianity? We've got Jesus being born, Emmanuel, God with us, realized as fully God and fully human. We've got Jesus dying on the cross, making the ultimate sacrifice for all we have done wrong. Or Jesus resurrected, defeating death to give us hope in life everlasting. So what do you think? Which one's the most important? They all are. They're entwined. Oh, yeah, yeah. The proper Christian response. I was kind of looking for you. Go on, push yourself to something. But go on, Caroline. What do you reckon? Is incredibly important. Absolutely, absolutely. So we find in today's passage one of, or arguably the most, but at least one of, the most important moments of Christianity. And who are the first witnesses? Women. Now, do you think God make, makes mistakes? 
because I'm convinced that is his plan. And absolutely, this is a uh, complete trick question because obviously Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, is quite important in Jesus being born. Uh, and also, albeit amongst uh, some men, there are many women who stand as key witnesses at his death on the cross. So actually, whichever you answer to this, biblically, women are key witnesses in each. Indeed, if we go on to look at Mary Magdalene, who's mentioned here in today's passage, listed first in that list of women. For hundreds, maybe thousands of years, she's been understood in the church as being a prostitute. Sometimes to positive ends. For example, there is a Magdalene community in America that helps women recovering from lives of drugs, prostitution, and abuse. Yet there is no specific biblical evidence that Mary Magdalene was ever a prostitute. It's quite likely that the confusion came uh, in the sixth century with the story of Mary of Egypt, who was a reformed prostitute, but not Mary Magdalene. And for so many years, Christians have been caught up in a debate over this disciple, Mary Magdalene, on whether she was a prostitute or not. Yet I wonder the focus could, maybe should, so easily have been on this woman who Jesus called Magdalene. Magdalene, which means tower. Oh, a woman who, like a tower, stands tall and proclaims the risen Jesus. You know, we managed that with Simon, who became Peter, or the rock. Not that, the rock. <laughs> That's Dwayne Johnson, who's a pro wrestler, if you didn't know. But not him, no. I mean the, uh, the rock of um, the rock, rock of the church. There's been so much written about Mary Magdalene, I urge you to go and look deep, deeper if that's piqued your interest. She sounds like an incredible and inspirational woman. Yet as Matthew Henry said, all our mistakes in religion spring from ignorance or forgetfulness of the words Christ has spoken. We keep making mistakes and forgetting. And that's why we need to keep reading our Bibles keep checking things out and also this is why we keep going back to some of these promises do you remember these some of you will that Lorraine put together in a series that we had a little while ago you see we forget the words Christ has spoken and get caught in the noise of the world I know I do you take that last few weeks where, you know, I had for the first time led and preached at churches where nobody knew me. It should, uh, it should have been a rich blessing to see God work in places and ways I have not seen or experienced before. Yet really, so much of my energy and time was taken away through my own nerves and feelings of not being good enough. But what? If I went in the realization of these things, that I am completing Christ, that I am God's workmanship created for good works, instead of being caught up in my own insecurities, I could spend more time seeing God at work, free to be an open spirited, open minded, and open hearted servant of God set on Christ's firm foundation. And I wonder where in your life you could use that too. So how can we look at ourselves and others through Jesus' eyes, set on the foundations we see here? It's apparent to me that in the biblical story, we see Jesus who is not racist, not sexist, nor elitist in any way. 
he clearly works beyond and through those barriers put up in the world. But he does also clearly to me favour some attributes which maybe explains why these women are the disciples who are chosen as witnesses of God's glory. I found some sections in Mark and the realness in the Bible is something I love. Uh, the humanity here is great. Feel free to read but I'll, I'll pick up some um, main parts. So in Mark 9, um, we come across the apostles who, whilst traveling, have been arguing amongst themselves which of them was the greatest. How stupidly human that is. <laughs> can you picture them arguing? And in, and in the middle there, you can see Jesus' response sitting down. He goes, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. The very last and the servant of all. You know, it's not, not just one verse out of context, because that's very dangerous. But again, in Mark 10, the two apostles Jesus called uh, the thuns of... I uh, can't even say it, put my teeth in. The sons of thunder, and I'm not going back to pro wrestling. They really were called that. Uh, they basically asked Jesus to make them next in command above the other apostles, which unsurprisingly makes all the other apostles quite cross. And Jesus set them down again, and anybody else getting a rather irate teacher. Let's just sit down. And he said this. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we see here that we are called as Christians not to lord our position, power or authority. That will not gain you anything in God's books. But if you want to be a great Christian, Jesus clearly states it, you must serve just as he did. Even if you have authority or position, we are called to lay it down to serve others. Something we see working out with Mary and the others in today's passage. It is these women who see Jesus buried. Broken hearted, they prepare the spices to embalm him. And imagine that task which awaits them. A body left for a few days in an especially hot country. You know, embalming is not going to be a nice task. Yet they are there to serve with and through their broken hearts, foregoing any authority or position, not just those two mighty Marys. There is another lady called Joanna, and she is the wife of King Herod's palace manager, a position of very high social standing. Yet they come to serve. It's them with servant hearts who eventually see and I say eventually, because even those of us who feel called to get a job done also need to be spiritually aware. They didn't come expecting to see the glory of God. Like many of us serving God, we often take it as our cross to bear. As I said, a job to get done. Yet we are reminded here to expect God to turn up. And he does, again, and again, I wonder, have you seen that in your life? And it takes the angels to remind them of the teaching they've heard. And it was there in Luke 9, earlier in Luke. And today we find in this passage a reminder, a call to live our Christian lives in a manner displaying that we are expectant, open-minded, and open-hearted servants dedicated to God, just like Jesus did. 
Amen.